So I have a really wonderful guest today and I'll first read out, actually, no, first I say hi, then I'll read out the official bio and then we'll go and talk about a very interesting topic. So hi, Neil. Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You know, I'm very honored that you you accepted my invitation and came to talk to me. I have to share that I personally love talking uh, with, uh, well, I would say people who come from the academic world, with scientists, with researchers, with people who have uh, actually very inquisitive mind and want to know the truth and not just guess at things. So I'm very honored. I love talking to people like you. So thank you. But now the official <laughs> official bio. Anil Seth is a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex. He's also co-director of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research Program on Brain, Mind and Consciousness, a European Research Council advanced investigator, editor in chief of the journal Neuroscience of Consciousness and a Wellcome Trust Engagement Fellow. He holds degrees in natural science, uh, knowledge-based systems, and computer science, and artificial intelligence. He has published more than 180 papers, is a web of science highly cited researcher, uh, which places him in the top 1% of researchers in his field worldwide. And Anil is the author of Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, uh, an instant Sunday Times uh, bestseller and uh, 2021 Book of the Year for The Economist, The New Statesman, Bloomberg Business, The Guardian, The Financial Times, and elsewhere. His 2017 TED Talk on consciousness has more than 12 million views and features in the top 15 TED science talks of all time. He has appeared on high profile podcasts, including Making Sense with Sam Harris and Under the Skin with Russell Brand, and now with Christina Mandlachiani. And now this one, exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, he has um, appeared in several films, the most unknown, The Search, appears regularly on BBC Radio and has written for Aeon, <coughs> sorry, The Guardian, uh, Granta, New Scientist and Scientific American, among others. He was the 2017 president of the British Science Association and the 2019 winner of the Kid Spirit Perspective Awards. It's such an impressive bio that uh, I have to probably take a moment to just oh, take a breath. I've, I've sent it to you if I'd known you're going to read it out loud. That's very, <laughs> I'm very embarrassed because I'm very English. So, but thank you. It's very kind of you. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's an interesting experience to hear your accomplishments accomplishments read back to you, uh, and I think it's uh, it's really it's really great actually sometimes to just take the time and to listen and to appreciate that it's it's been a wonderful journey and I, I guess uh, there's still a wonderful journey ahead. So we're going to be talking about consciousness, a very cool topic. And before we go into this topic, I I probably have to ask the question which is the most natural in our context because I'm a co-founder of Mindvalley and we talk about personal growth and transformation. And of course, the way we uh, use consciousness in our everyday life is not exactly a scientific approach. It's usually uh, more on the borderlines of, uh, you know, awareness of being uh, conscious of what's going on, but not conscious as in biologically conscious, but more um, in on your brain level, you know, you, are, you understand you're not on autopilot. So uh, for example, in our context, we could talk about not being conscious just because you're an autopilot you haven't noticed how you drove from your house to the office which biologically speaking is probably not right so since i'm talking to a scientist let's do like all the science starts the definitions what is consciousness in your interpretation i mean in your research not your interpretation but your research yeah it's a good place to start because the word is used um in different ways and and uh, so the yeah well so the way i use it is really very it's very simple too um, and it is simply referring to any kind of experience, any kind of subjective experience. This could be as simple as the pain of a toothache or the, the, the sight, the experience of seeing the color red or the feeling of joy when you, you know, see someone you love or something like that. Um, any kind of conscious experience. So it's important. It's not the same thing as uh, reflecting back on your own experiences or remembering them or thinking about them or planning in the future or being aware of what's happening in the wider world i mean these these i think are the some of the other uses that, that you were talking about but the philosopher thomas nagel said for a conscious creature 
there is something it is like to be that creature. And that's the most fundamental level. There's something, it feels like something to be me and it feels like something to be you, but it doesn't feel like anything to be you know, uh, this, this cup of tea. It just is. It doesn't feel like anything to be a, a car. Um, and it almost certainly doesn't feel like anything to be a computer, although some people disagree and think that computers start to have uh, feelings too. And feelings, I'm not just talking about emotional feelings, just that any kind of experience, a visual experience, um, as an experience of smelling something. That is, I think, the most fundamental meaning of the word. And it's really the, the, the ground state for all the other types of consciousness too. Unless we're conscious in that raw sense of having experience, this, it go, which goes away, for instance, when you go into general anesthesia, then there's nothing. And then you come around and it comes back. Everything else is built on that basic foundation. Mm -hmm. So uh, a natural thing to ask would be if consciousness is about feeling or seeing the color, perceiving the color, then are animals conscious? <laughs> I, it's actually a dangerous question in our context, it I guess. It, it, well, it's, it's, it's one of those really tricky questions because we all have strong intuitions right, about, about animals, but they're quite variable. So you know, if we have pets, obviously we think the pets are conscious. Um, and we were pretty sure that or most of us seem pretty sure about other furry creatures of about the right shape and size. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, you ask people about maybe spiders or flies or fish, and it becomes a lot less clear. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's really hard to know, because strictly speaking, it's very hard for me to know that even whether anybody else, any other human is conscious. I, I only have access to my own conscious experience. Now, of course, I don't believe that I'm the only conscious person in the world. Um, all humans have very similar brains. We're all going to be conscious. And when we look at other animals, we can judge a little bit by their similarity to, to humans and make some best guess about whether they're likely to be aware too. And I think you, you, you can go quite far. And for me anyway, there's really strong evidence that all mammals are conscious and then probably a lot of other creatures as well. Creatures like octopuses, um, some fish, some insects, but it's really hard to know to where to draw the line. The different, the key thing here for me is that other species are likely to be conscious in very different ways than, mm -hmm. than humans are. So their, their visual worlds, their, their, their subjective worlds, are going to be quite different. We know, for instance, that cats see color very differently. But imagine mm -hmm. what, what it's like to be an octopus where you can taste with your skin and you can change size and shape. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can, you, your world is going to be very, very different indeed. To animals, I want to come back to animals. I oh. actually don't know why, but I guess sometimes in comparison, it's easier to understand yourself. So your book says being you. Do animals have the sense of you? Uh, why I'm asking that is that I've seen some animals noticing themselves in reflection and not realizing it's them. Or uh, I do not know if that's a sign that they don't uh, understand that I'm me or it's just uh, not perceiving the reflection in the mirror the same way as we do. Uh, so is there any signs behind like, uh, do animals actually have the sense of self? And if, uh, if they do, so what does, does set us apart from animals and is it even important? Maybe we are exactly like all the other animals and that's good enough. That's, I mean, you picked up on something really, really important there. In fact, that's one of the most widely used tests in sort of the study of animal mind and animal consciousness is it's called the mirror self-recognition test and it's full, full name, but it's exactly that. Like for you, for you and I, for humans, it's just very intuitive. We don't have to think about it. You know, we look in the mirror and for better or for worse, we recognize that what's staring back is, is us. Um, but even humans, this, this doesn't begin at birth. Uh, we develop this capability. So take a baby before, usually around 18 months of age, mirror self-recognition is just not there. Uh, babies can't do it. Um, does this mean that babies are unconscious? Of course not. It just means they lack a specific kind of awareness of the self. And I would say it doesn't even mean they lack a sense of self. It just means they lack one particular aspect of sense of self, which is that sort of aspect where you can recognize yourself as distinct from others in this particular way. You can kind of take a perspective on yourself. Mm -hmm. And this has been used pretty widely in studies on animals because you can adapt it to all sorts of animals. You typically do it by painting a, a dot on their 
forehead somewhere or face. And then when they look in the mirror, you see, do they use the mirror to investigate their own body or do they kind of look at the mirror as if it's another um, a conspecific, another animal? And surprisingly few animals reliably pass this test. It is uh, you know, cats and dogs fail it. All our sort of favorite pet animals fail it. A few <laughs> other primates do it, like orangutans and gorillas and, and some chimpanzees. The odd elephant has been able to pass it and dolphins. But that's about it. Mm. Uh, so monkeys don't do it, um, even though they're very smart in other ways. So what do we conclude from this? I think it's failure on this thing is like, is, is a bit odd because animals may fail the, this test for all sorts of reasons. They may not like mirrors. They might not like making eye contact. Um, they just can't be bothered with this test. They don't really care what's going on. Uh, but it does still seem quite, quite striking. But even if they really can't recognize themselves in the mirror, there are many other ways in which selfhood exists. So for me, being a self is not just one thing. It's, it's a whole combination of different as types of experience that come together in a particular way in humans, but may come together in different ways in other species. So you know, we, we, I know that this object here is my body. You know, I experience this as being my body. That's part of being a self. Emotions and moods, I think, are part of self. They're not part of an experience of the world outside. An emotion is a sort of experience of my body being in a particular state with respect to the world. That's part of self. So I think many, many animals share these aspects of selfhood, even if they don't recognize themselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Well, I suddenly remembered how my cat was sick and I decided to put a coat on her and she didn't enjoy the, the contact with her, with her body. She definitely has some, some sense of her body. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to. Um, I, I can't promise that I'll let a lot of people actually join the conversation because I'm so curious about this topic. Uh, it's it's just so interesting. But you mentioned the babies, and I want to ask this question. I heard you actually being asked that question, and I, I was I was curious to ask it too. When does consciousness begin, and when does it end? Well, I think it ends when we die, or, or you know, it can end transiently when we go under general anesthesia. Um, it doesn't go away when we go to sleep. I, mean, I think it may vary for small parts of sleep. I think it might. But for most of the time when we're sleeping, obviously there are these parts of sleep when we dream. And when we're dreaming, we're, we're definitely almost by definition conscious because a dream is a sort of sequence of experiences. Um, but even when we're not dreaming, then it turns out lots of studies have shown now that if you wake people up in these stages of sleep, which are not associated with dreaming and ask people, was anything going on for you? Most of the time they say yes. And it might be very simple things like, uh, you know, experiences of just a repeated pattern or, or a verbal phrase or something like that. But I think we're very rarely completely unconscious. General anesthesia is the big example for me because you're out and you, you know, you're out and you're back and there's, n there's nothing it's like to be you in the, in the interim. Mm -hmm. And then when you die, I do think consciousness goes away. When does it appear? Um, this is a, again, it's a really difficult question because we can't ask, just as we can't ask uh, other animals, hey, are you conscious? <laughs> uh, we can't ask newborn babies uh, or, or even fetuses or uh, that question either. So we have to infer it by, okay, when do the sorts of brain structures and brain dynamics that we associate with consciousness um, in, ad, in, in later in life, when do they start to emerge in development? And they, again, it's not, not, it's not that everything comes online at the same time. Uh, it's, it sort of happens bit by bit. So there are signs of visual consciousness of, of babies being aware of the, the world around them visually um, quite quickly. Uh, but again, they, they may be aware before that. It's just, a diff it's just being expressed in a different way. Personally, I think it's very likely that, that babies are conscious in some form from the mm -hmm. moment of, of birth, mm -hmm. but that the complexity, the, the elaboration, the way it may even be, say William James, who was one of the founders of psychology, he, he famously described the world as an infant, world of an infant as a blooming and buzzing confusion, <laughs> which might be that, that, you know, for us, it's very clear that 
well, I'm looking at something. And when I, when I look at something, it's very different from hearing something. Mm -hmm. But it's possible that for newborn babies, the sort of distinction between what you hear and what you see is just, it's just not there. It might get all, all mixed up and we learn to separate our senses um, mm -hmm. as we develop. Uh, so another question I wonder about is how are consciousness and sense, self of sense connected? And is one possible without another? <laughs> I, I think it is. And you know, many people who practice uh, deep states of meditation you know, may tell you that there are, there are very deep meditative states where the sense of self might dissolve entirely. And you enter these states of almost what's described as pure awareness, where, where they're just experiences is flowing, but you don't experience any, any center, um, subjective center within that. I, you know, I do meditate, but I'm certainly not an expert in that. And that degree, so my sense of self doesn't go away. I think they're related in a very intimate way. So broadly speaking, we can be conscious of things in the world around us. Um, and that's a form of perception, right? I have visual perceptions. I have auditory perceptions, olfactory, smell-based perceptions. And all these perceptions are based on sensory signals coming in through the eyes and, and the ears. Uh, but the sense of self, I think the key thing, the key realization for me quite some years ago was that the self is not this thing inside the skull that's doing the perceiving, that is the recipient of all this information. The self is another kind of perception. So mm. the brain is making sense in this case of sensory information that's coming from the body, from where the body is in space, from what's coming from inside the body, you know, the, all the, what the heart is doing, what the, what the stomach is doing, the lungs are doing. Um, and all the aspects of self, like emotion and feeling of this is my body. And you know, these are all for me grounded on the brain's perception of the body. And this is why I think the body is so important in understanding consciousness, but also in understanding what it means to be a human self. It's not mm -hmm. you know, we, we, these days we think of too many people think of the body as like just this meat robot that takes your brain from one meeting to another, but it, it really isn't like that at all. You know, our bodies are, are so important, but they're, they're often a bit overlooked um, to, and it, it, well, it depends who you talk to, but, but I do think the, the body and the brain and the mind are very, very intimately connected. And, and that connection is nowhere more obvious than when it comes to the self. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm uh, slightly jumping right now in my questions, but uh, one more question that I have is, um, uh, well, <laughs> I think uh, uh, it's, um, you know, um, if we, uh, I, I understand that uh, the topic of consciousness in science is not a complete mystery. It's myster mysterious in many aspects, but we also understand about it, how, how it's, um, anatomy happens or we can uh, look at it clinically that consciousness like let's say if your brain is functioning and you you perceive the information and it's uh, processed in the brain then you you kind of get the consciousness uh, so uh, how does it and and thank god you you meditate and you, you you're familiar with with the spiritual world uh, isn't uh, isn't that a little bit um, scary in a way if you explain everything even consciousness maybe even self, self sense of self with biological procedures and processes and look at it anatomically that it kind of takes away the possibility of there being uh, a god or you yeah. know the scientifically unexplained component to this whole thing i mean that's such an interesting question and it's something i do think about quite quite a lot because I personally never feel that way, but but I recognize that other people sometimes might, and I wonder where that 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 comes from. Um, well, Stephen Hawking was very straightforward with that. He said, you know, there are laws of nature, and everything else is just uh, <laughs> what we wish. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, I certainly, you know, just to be very upfront about it, I don't. I you know, I certainly don't. I'm. I don't believe in. God, as is traditionally expressed in, in religion, <laughs> but I have a lot of time for, for 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 the traditions of religion, and a lot of time, especially for for the traditions of Buddhism and so on, because they emphasize a lot of deep truths about the world and about the self that science has been very very slow to to grasp onto, like the impermanence of the self, the impermanence of, of all things, and the the um you know, the the need to escape 
desire in order to escape suffering so i think there's a lot to learn and and of course religious beliefs give people uh, a lot of comfort as well but you know ultimately i am interested in the truth and in how things work and in what the laws of nature are and in how consciousness might fit into our wider picture of nature and is this something that that could be be scary well i don't really think so and the reason is that I think that when we understand a phenomenon uh, through science, philosophy, and just how it works, it, it always seems to be a little bit more wonderful than before. You know, I take take the take take a couple of the big sort of beliefs that that people had over history. There, there was a belief that yeah, the Earth is at the center of the universe, and, and yeah. the stars are just on like rotating spheres around us. They're the heavens, the seven circles of the heaven. And of course, we, we know that's not true. And we now know that we're just this tiny speck in a vast abyss among billions of galaxies. The universe is so much vaster than anybody could have imagined before astronomy. Is that deflating? It kind of scary, but I think scary in a way, it's almost like it evokes awe and the sublime. I think mm-hmm. it's rather wonderful. And it makes us feel a little less uh, central. I think it's, it's it's a good lesson for us as a society because we can become a little bit more humble about our place in the universe and in the world. And the same thing happened with Darwin and the theory of evolution. Mm-hmm. Before, you know, and this this these beliefs varied a lot in different cultures, of course. But in Western cultures, there was this like, yeah, we're sep- we're special because we're separate from other animals. And um, Rene Descartes, who was one of the foundational philosophers of mind called other animals beast machines that they you know, were like flesh and blood machines but they didn't really feel anything they lacked the rational minds that humans have and so lacked the moral status then evolution came along and said no look we're all connected mm-hmm. we all have common ancestors and we're all ad- adapted we're animals too and again is it scary well only if you think there's something that we really have to hang on to that that, that makes us apart from nature um, I think it's more beautiful to see us as continuous with nature. And I think the same thing applies with consciousness too, that as we understand more about it, for me, it becomes more precious uh, and more wonderful. And we can recognize just what, a, what an everyday miracle it is to experience things. The world, mm-hmm. the universe didn't have to be this way, that mm-hmm. it could deliver organisms like us that can experience the sense of awe, a sense of joy, a sense of love. And that, it always, for me, it adds, it never subtracts. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just talked about evolution and I suddenly uh, started wondering about the other aspect of when did consciousness uh, appear. Mm. Evolutionarily speaking, how could that have happened? Did our biological system just get so far upgraded that suddenly a new function popped up like in a game now you have consciousness is there yeah. any research in that i mean it, well there is but it's it's very very hard because consciousness doesn't it doesn't leave any direct fossil evidence <laughs> you can't look at sort of we can say a lot about when legs evolved uh, because <laughs> legs leave a, a fossil record they're made of bones that, but in my experience of talking to you now you know, unfortunately, will not leave a trace in the fossil record, but you know, maybe some hard drive will still exist somewhere 10 million <laughs> years later. So it's all a bit speculative, and it all depends on what we think the functions of consciousness are. And so if you can make some sort of in- inferences about that, then you can start to make some guesses about when consciousness might, might have arose in, in evolution. And so... I th- the estimates would vary so that probably the origin of, of mammals so towards the end of the dinosaur period and you, you'd think okay maybe all mammals are conscious and so maybe consciousness was was in emerged then maybe it was before it it's really very hard to tell i don't tend to make very strong speculations about this but what i think is quite remarkable to consider when you ask this question is that if consciousness evolved it seems to be a biological phenomenon. It seems to be a very tightly associated with our brains. Our brains have to be in a particular state to be conscious. Then there was a time 
where there were no conscious organisms on this world and perhaps even anywhere in the galaxy or universe and that's a that's a a really incredible thought that for the longest time the world just sort of the universe just unfolded following mm. the laws of nature and there was nothing to experience it happening and then at some point there was and i don't know when that was but just the fact that there was there was a before is is quite a difficult concept to hold in mind clearly so we humans research consciousness scientifically why do we do that is that just pure curiosity or there are some practical um, reason for that well for one of course anesthesia the the full anesthesia is obviously helpful but, yeah. but <laughs> that probably didn't come from the research of consciousness that's probably have contributed to the research of consciousness yeah you're right in fact it's it's been you know, for quite a long time actually to the frustration of I think people in both camps, there was not that much interaction between, let's say, anesthesiologists and neuroscientists or scientists working on consciousness. That's all changed. I think the fundamental motivation for many people in, in my area is, is curiosity. It's, it's one of the big remaining mysteries. We have this like chunk of wetware inside our skulls and somehow it brings about this inner universe. And people have been wondering how this happens for thousands of years. And we may not be in a position to completely crack it, but this is a very exciting time to be working on this problem. We have the ability to use brain in scanners to look inside the brain as people have conscious experiences or, or go out or lose consciousness in anesthesia. We can actually study what's going on in the brain. Um, we have new theories. We just, we just have a lot more insight into the problem than, than we ever did before. So curiosity is the main driver, but I think there are practical applications too. And perhaps where they meet is in understanding the self. Now, I really want to understand you know, what it means to be me. That's why I wrote the book. And um, that's an objective curiosity, but it's also a very practical knowledge to have. You know, understanding more about why I am the way I am can really help in, in everyday life. It can help me relate to others. It can help me understand my own mental life as, as I you know, relate to my emotions and my thoughts in perhaps healthier ways. And then more generally, this, this naturalistic understanding of consciousness is useful in, as you might expect, in, in medicine, in understanding what's happening in psychiatric conditions, in depression and schizophrenia and other forms of psychosis. Uh, after brain damage and brain injury, we're starting to see real applications in the clinic now where we can diagnose whether people still are conscious after major brain injury in, in much better ways than was possible 10, 15 years ago. And when people hallucinate in psychosis, you know, we're beginning to understand why. And of course, that can provide new opportunities to find treatments and then there are all the ethical applications. We understand more about animal consciousness, just to go back to that. You know, mm -hmm. That's going to inform our welfare policies and how we treat other animals. So it's a hugely, and then there's, oh, I could go on and on. I mean, legal frameworks, it, when we understand the neural basis of voluntary action, like mm -hmm. we decided to have this conversation. Why did we do it? What, what led to us have, making these voluntary decisions when somebody commits a crime? Historically, people, there have always been this like it's a crime of passion or the defense of insanity. But as we understand much more about the brain basis of free will, then that's going to have a lot of implications for when we hold people responsible for their actions. So it's the, the applications are in so many areas and a lot of that's yet to play out. Mm. Uh, thank you. I do see Zing, uh, Zing Yu, I hope I pronounce you properly, Zing Yu Yao, uh, here to join us, but I do have to ask one more question. I'm sorry. I hope you have patience to listen to this one more question, and then I'll pass the microphone to you. So uh, we, we were talking about this one um, one instance when we lose consciousness for uh, for a period of time, whether it's under anesthesia or I have a, a friend and a colleague who was actually in coma for for a few months, and for her it was just she oh, wow. she blacked out and she came out and she said yeah. she she had no experience of in between. Yeah. But people don't lose self a sense of self in that process mostly, unless I guess there's a massive brain damage. When they go out and when they come back, there's continuity in me understanding that I'm the same me. So yes. there is a disconnect between self and sen uh, self sense and consciousness, at least biologically. Yeah, no, I mean, this is this is I think 
things like coma and anesthesia are pretty remarkable for that because, uh, yeah, you tend to be, at least to some extent, the same person when you when you come back on the other side. You know, if you've lost consciousness entirely, so in that gap, your sense of self is gone as well. But just when it resumes, there's a continuity. I mean, it depends on the brain damage. Sometimes that's not true, and that can be very yeah. that can be very very distressing. But yeah, we we experience ourselves as being continuous over time and, and here's again i think something where there's a convergence between neuroscience and and some of the more spiritual traditions that recognize that perhaps we we're not as continuous as we might think we are you know, we, we do change over time uh, mm. myself now is different from myself five years ago and even a little bit different from myself five weeks ago yeah. Um, no, I recently felt this. I've just been recovering from long COVID. You know, I, I got ill in, in late November. Wow. And for the last six months, I've been, I felt like a different person. And, you know, I've really noticing my sense of self is very, very different. And only in the last three, four weeks, I've started to like, oh, yeah. And, you know, we have all these expressions for it. It's like, you look like yourself again. I'm starting to feel like myself again. They're very colloquial, but they really, indicate a deep truth that that the self does change but myself now having recovered having spent six months being quite ill I don't think is the same self as was there beforehand you know I've, I, I hope I think and I hope I've actually changed in some way and there's this phenomenon in psychology called change blindness when something changes very very slowly like we do the experiments where like people you know maybe there's a video but maybe the wall behind you is changing color very slowly people never notice the change um that's why it's called change blindness and mm -hmm. i think the same applies to the self like our experience of being who we are does change does change but because it changes slowly we never experience the change happening mm -hmm. and then you know, like aging might, in the mirror yeah exactly and you don't you don't see it happens but then you look back at a photo from 20 years ago and you you think who is that person or oh, jesus what have i become who is that hottie <laughs> <laughs> so uh we have uh zing you uh i hope you can join us yes yes Hi. okay zing i'm going to switch off my microphone so that i don't create echo but i'm here sure Thank you. Nice to meet you and get online. I it's pretty late here, so I can't open my camera. But I have a question is uh, about I see you are in you know in leading position in many different institutes and research. I'm curious about what are the most cutting edge research that's going on right now at those institutes? Because I personally am interested in to going to the path of PhD and uh, you know, potentially like music and consciousness mm -hmm. is, is my area of interest because I work as a professional music therapist and I uh, sometimes work with people at hospice you know, using music therapy to support them at the end of their life, basically they're transitioning. And sometimes I have patients wow. who are in coma and through music therapy, I can bring them back to consciousness and connect with their family. So yeah, that's that's why I want to ask this question. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, that's such an amazing work that you do, and that you, I mean, there's so much evidence that that music yes. is such a powerful way of connecting with with people who are in, um, you know, let's say, an abnormal states of consciousness, whether it's in coma, or vegetative state, or or in Alzheimer's in, in late life. Um, or with other psychiatric or mental health issues. And, and I'm sure you know a lot more about that th than I do, but it's very, very, you know, we, we're, there's something that's distinctively human is our response to music. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just briefly, you know, other animals don't show this. You know, we, you have music, we just tap to the beat almost instinctively. Pretty yeah. much no other creature does that apart from some songbirds. And you know, that's yeah, yeah. just, that's a remarkable <laughs> thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, there's this, there's, I actually have a good colleague of mine uh, is a, a researcher at Harvard called Ani Patel, a Tuft, not Harvard, it's in Boston. And mm -hmm. he's worked for many, many years on the interaction between music and consciousness and, and how humans perceive 
uh, music and especially the relationship between music and language. So I think there's a lot of evidence that our, our, our ability to, well, our, our, our natural facility with language is very closely coupled with our natural facility with music. They're both sequences over time and require processing information over, over time. So there's a lot of research going on in that area. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, this gives me a great chance just to mention one of the things I'm working on right now, since you asked that as well. Yeah, I love to see it, that. Yeah. It's not strictly, it's, it's not, well, it is got a lot of science components to it, but it's, um, it just launched on Monday in London. And it's this thing called uh, Dream Machine, which I'm going to put in the chat. Um, and it's a collaboration between neuroscientists, me, and philosophers and architects and musicians. Um, oh. The, I don't know if anybody here knows the electronic uh, composer John Hopkins. Um, he's quite a, he's yeah, pretty good musician here, um, and uh, and and designers and engineers. And what we're doing in the Dream Machine, we're, we're reinventing a a contraption from the 1950s. Uh, a, friend, a guy called Brian Geisen, who was the um, a friend of William Burroughs, these beat artist and poet, and he built what he called a dream machine then, which was that basically a, uh, you had a, a bright light, which you put, you hung above a record player and you had some cardboard, uh, you had a piece of cardboard around it with some slits in and it spun on the record player so that you got flashing stroboscopic lights. And he, discussed, he, he sort of found out that if you sit in front of this light with your eyes closed, then most people have very vivid visual experiences visual hallucination bright lights and bright colors rich colors patterns movement when all that's going on is just flashing white light and this is a, a phenomenon in neuroscience we've known about also for decades and in my lab we've been working on it for about 10 years as a sort of side project but a couple of years ago just around the start of the pandemic it all uh, came together and I was part became part of this team with Hopkins and uh, some architects and so on and we built uh, we got funding to build a 21st century version of the dream machine which which turns it into a collective experience so at the launch on, in London on on Monday we for the first time we had groups of the public in and that 30 people can go in at once and they go on this very curated journey and they sit in this, this carefully designed space. There's a, a light sequence and uh, music, which is, which is back to the question, a key, it has such an impact on the overall experience. So the music is really changing how we experience the lights. Uh, and, and everybody has a different experience, but they're having collectively a shared experience too. And so they come out and then we've also designed ways where they tell us about their experience and they try to recreate it using drawing or these interactive tools that we develop with some digital designers. And then we're looking forward to analyzing this data to try and figure out why people have the different experiences they have. And this is part of a much larger project, which is still going on within the dream machine available to anyone in the world, which is um, called the perception census. And this is a way of mapping out how we all differ in the way we experience things like we all we all differ from the outside and we're getting more used to this idea that um you know we're different skin colors and genders and shapes and sizes and and that's good and that's that's rich but we all differ on the inside too and it's not just at the extremes where people are mentally ill or they might be you know have autism or, or something else or synesthesia the red you know the blue sky that i might see out of the window might be a different shade of blue to somebody else we just mm -hmm. don't know because we use yeah. the same words so i'm leading this research project to try and understand for the first time how different our inner worlds are and i think that firstly it's it's just curiosity but also there's lots of implications here and i think we can understand each other you know very grandly i think we stand to yeah. understand and relate to each other better when we know that it's not just we can have different beliefs about the world, but we might literally see the world in, in different ways. Yeah. And so this is, this is, I'm very excited about this project. Wow, so you can actually bring more empathy. Like I know your world better, like, cause I know how different it can be and yeah. Yeah, That's do you remember that photo of the dress that like half the world saw as blue and white, or blue and black and half saw as yellow and white? I mean, that's a good example, right? Because it's the same photo 
and you just have this polarization and I suspect something like that but much less dramatic is going on all the time. Mm -hmm. I also saw like your research about uh, how you know different language because we have different words to describe the color and sometimes you know how detail how specific they are actually impact our perception of yeah. color that's like uh, amazing for me yeah that's that's the uh, it's like it's called the sapir wolf hypothesis this idea that you know what we think can really drive down and affect what we perceive in russian speakers are you a russian speaker <laughs> i speak yeah. russian oh. yeah i speak russian they have two different words for blue exactly so you but you, you there's evidence that you will actually see more yeah, shades so, of blue than, than non-russian speakers and you know and and you won't uh, like you, you the two Russian speakers will call different colors exactly the right word. Yes. Others don't understand. I actually want to ask uh, on the back of those questions, but a little bit with a twist. Uh, Zinu, uh, thank you. Uh, Bianca, if we, if, if we have time for one more question, I'd really be glad to give an opportunity because so many people want to ask questions and I'm always too talkative. I have too many questions of my own. But I want to ask this question. Uh, I know that uh, you just mentioned actually that there's blindness to change and I know that there are a lot of tricks that our brains do to us whether it's visual or audio or uh, I, I'm just very curious about that and I know that our brain tricks us all the time how does that uh, change uh, our consciousness does that mean that our consciousness is one big illusion uh, or, or it's okay <laughs> It's okay. I think is, is the main thing there. I think it's, it's this, is, this is like, this is actually the, probably the core of the research that I, that I do at, at Sussex here is, is understanding the relationship between what we perceive and what's actually there. And, um, you know, we're all familiar with these visual illusions and optical illusions that, that, you know, two lines, they look different lengths. Oh, they're the same length or something like that. And yeah. I think we've been tricked, but I don't like the word illusion because I, you know, I think this is, this is also going on all the time. Um, if you think about the problem, the challenge faced by the brain in figuring out what's there is that all the sensory information that comes in is, is pretty ambiguous. It's quite noisy. It's not got labels on that I'm coming from this or that. And the brain has to make sense of it. And it can only make sense of it by having some prior idea some prior prediction about what the world is like and what we actually perceive is some some balance between what the sensory signals say and what the brain already thinks is there and uh this happens all the times and optical illusions just sort of illustrate that process quite nicely you know, even something as basic as color so color colors that we experience, whether it's blue or multiple shades of blue for Russian speakers, they, they don't exist objectively out there in the world, right? The, it's, the light is just sensitive to wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and only three wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. And out mm -hmm. of those three wavelengths, the brain generates a whole world of color. I think the artist Cezanne said it best when he said that color is where the brain and the universe meet. Uh, and all of our perception is like that. Yes, a real world exists. That's true. You know, I'm not saying that it's all made up. The world exists. But the way in which we experience the world is always a construction of the brain. It's the brain's best guess of what's going on, uh, which is why I like to call it a controlled hallucination, which <laughs> emphasizes that it is constructed. It's made up, but it's controlled. It's, it's not arbitrary. It's closely, intimately tied to you. We use the brain uses sensory signals to tie its hallucinations to the world, but it does it not in a way that's trying to maximize accuracy, because in that case, we would never experience colors. Colors are not accurate, but our perceptual experience has been designed by evolution to help us, you know, to help us survive, to help us behave. So we see the world, to make another quote from an, and the, the novelist Anais Nin, we, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Mm. and because we're all different too we'll, we'll all see the world uh, differently so and i think again that's it it's a i think it's a really empowering recognition because it stops us taking things for granted mm. 
Thank you. And this is the topic I'd really love to dive into, but I had promised to give a microphone to someone else of my guests, and I have Berta here. So if you're ready, I'm going to mute myself and you can unmute yourself and have the conversation for, for a little while. Berta? I, let me unmute you. No, I can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. Uh, I am so yeah, happy yeah. to be here. I've been looking forward to this talk very much you know and uh, i have three topics very different connected the main one that i'm uh, interested in is uh, about love you know conscious and unconsciousness you know you have uh, uh, we've been raised unconsciously and i raise my children unconsciously and i see you know how painful it is when you learn about consciousness and uh, conscious parenting and and really are deep in it and see the behaviors. Oh, it's a big topic. You see, I'm wondering about conscious love and conscious love in that sense. You see, and uh, I am in a in a you know pilot experiment about love, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, what can you what, what can you tell me about that? You know, the <laughs> other topic is I'm a teacher, yeah. and I see different levels and ages of students. And uh, last week I went to uh second grade classes and i was really appalled by see this lesson plan that i have to see cut out in minutes you know and the students the reactions you know it just i was suffering you see and uh, i'm linking it with the iadd killing curiosity killing you know uh creativity i, I am not sure i like you to take that that and uh, I guess the uh, second part, I have a school, what I founded, and I teach Spanish, and I do a lot of uh, music, yes, and then rhythm. And my students are able to speak and understand any native speaker. You see, it's, uh, I, I got tired of teaching at the university, high school, and all the system is so, oh, so different. And I created a new system where students learn so happily. Uh, that's all. I just wanted to mention that. But it's yeah. connected with yeah. music. Someone talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's thank you. We'll have only. We. I have to remind you. We only have seven minutes left. So, okay. if yeah. I'll, I'll try and be very quick in the, in the response. But thank you for for those. You know, lots of wonderful topics there. Um, I mean, firstly, I think you're absolutely right about education and you know we, we do a lot of work with schools as part of this dream machine thing here and you know i think often kids get educated out of curiosity in particular and i think that's that's really a tragedy we should be fostering creativity and curiosity uh in young children because they have it it's there it's it's intrinsically there um and when it comes to i think there was at the beginning of what you were saying there's we have to be careful about distinguishing these different meanings of conscious right and so when you're bringing up kids it's not that you do it when you're totally unconscious like you would be in a coma or under anesthesia you know you, you're a, you're conscious but you you're sort of i would say doing it instinctively rather than in a in a in a reflective way i think that's the distinction at play here we, we sort of do things instinctively without thinking about it so much that's sometimes a, a form of unconscious um and to sort of be aware of what we're doing and what effect we're having is is beneficial but it's it's a different kind of, of consciousness um the other thing you mentioned which is really perplexing and i must admit i really haven't thought about it very much is the sort of the, the emotion of love and how this plays into it you know it, it's for me it's like so there's a whole a number of psychologists that would say that emo emotions are the one special category of perceptions that cannot be unconscious right like, we know that visual experience, we can do experiments where I, I can show you visual image and I can show that it affects your brain and what you do, but you will never see that image. It's, it will be unconsciously perceived. Um, but emotions, is it even, does it make even, even make any sense to say there's such a thing as an unconscious emotion? Is it only an emotion if I consciously feel it? Ah. <laughs> And, and there's no, yeah, I mean, that's a conscious emotion you're having there for sure, right? That's not an unconscious emotion. And I don't know whether it would make any sense to talk about unconscious love. I, I, I just don't think it, I have to think about that some more. So it's a good question. 
do we inherit this unconsciousness? You know, uh, how do, I mean, I'm sure it's connected with society and with enlightenment periods and many other things that, you know, business and so forth. And, but somehow, if we are able to really learn how to be conscious parent, or at least try to be conscious parents, and trying to do with a little boy, conscious parent, very different mother, mothering than I, I was with, the, with my children. I consider myself as an adult child when I raise my children, and you know how painful it is, but when you realize of that. Uh, and emotions, I think we need to know uh, about them and also how to react, educate ourselves about the emotions. And so uh, otherwise, you know, that's the reason I ask you if there is conscious emotion we have to know about how to react about them Berta, so Berta I, I think I get you where you're going but we we, do, we did talk about the different definitions of, con of consciousness and uh, I think um, uh, I, I think it is a slightly different topic from what we were talking about right now uh, but thank you for your question and we really have just a few minutes left to to close up i have to be conscious conscious in a different way conscious of time <laughs> now i'll be very conscious about using the word conscious but i do want to ask one a little bit um a, a little bit um scandalous question maybe uh but uh you don't have to give a very serious answer to that but i know that you're also researching ai and then this is the yeah. Darling, darling topic of a lot of uh, movies uh, and utopias about the future and, and even superhero movies. Uh, how about consciousness and actually artificial intelligence? Uh, is there a chance or it's just a fantasy? A chance of what? A chance of a, a conscious computer or a conscious robot? Ever, a con con yeah, I don't know. Uh, we, we were talking about biological systems evolving to yeah. the point when consciousness appeared. Maybe we're talking about million years. Maybe we're talking yeah, about yeah. Million years. No, I mean, it's, actually, I think it's a really serious topic, actually. And I just think it's, it's hard to say anything very concrete about it. Um, you know, my from intuition is that consciousness is not something that you can program into a computer. You know, it depends on the stuff we're made of. But, you know, I don't have 100% confidence in that, in that belief. I just haven't. It's, it's still an intuition. It makes a lot of sense, but it's not something I can show. Um, so there is this all this hype indeed about people, you know, AI is moving quite quickly. And yeah, I, I work a lot with AI as well. And we develop algorithms and so on. And we try and use them as, as models of the brain. I mean, it's very, it's a very good thing to do. And, and also for its own sake, you know, AI is, is, can be extremely useful. Um, but there, firstly, there are, meant, there are already plenty of things to worry about with AI, that it's, it, as with any powerful technology, it can offer great benefits, but it can also be very disruptive. And we're seeing that in sort of social media and the way, you know, search engines work, just all sorts of things that introduce bias into things. And there are all sorts of problems with AI that, that are much more here and now, whereas a conscious robot taking over the world is so far off into the future that if we focus all our attention on that, then we lose track of some of the issues that are much more uh, in the present. Having said that, I think it's a really terrible idea even to try to build a conscious computer um, because the ethical implications would be catastrophic. As soon as you build something that has experiences, you, um, you have a moral obligation to it. You, know, you, you might be suffering. And what's even worse is you might not even recognize a form of suffering that it has. For other animals, even if they're very different, it's often easy to sort of intuit whether they're in pain or in pleasure though admittedly the further away they get from being human the harder it is but you know if I've just got a box on on my desk how do I know maybe it's having an intense experience of suffering uh, mm. so I think it's a really it's just like it, it sounds cool but when something sounds cool that's not a good rationale for doing it and um, we should be very careful I mean the last thing I want to say about this is that what I think is much more plausible is we'll get technologies which appear to be conscious, even though they're not. And we're nearly there in the virtual world with sort of language generation algorithms and deep fakes that you know, can create avatars that are very lifelike. And that in itself is quite disruptive because we will start, we may start interacting with these things like in the movie Her, um, 
And that might lead us to neglect our relationships with things that actually other people and other animals that actually do have conscious lives. Mm. So I, I think it really is a serious question. That, that said, there's a lot of benefits to the, the interaction between the fields too. We can, we can perhaps build better AI uh, devices by understanding what consciousness in humans is good for. And it's good for many things. We do many things well because we consciously perceive them. And that will help us address a lot of the limitations that mm. current AI has. And, and that's a, a long-term research uh, agenda of mine also. Uh, I feel so horrible to finish this conversation because I, I, I feel we could have gone on and on and on. And honestly, yeah. maybe we should have you back if you have the opportunity, because it's, it's super in interesting. And talking about uh, not recognizing somebody's suffering, I think we don't even recognize each other's sufferings, let alone a completely different species like a robot. Uh, then, um, so I totally agree with you. Uh, guys, traditionally, those who are right now live, I want to ask you to leave a heart for my guest. It was such a wonderful <laughs> conversation. Uh, if you watch it in a recording, uh, leave a heart in the comments below. Uh, I'll still be up for a few minutes to, to say my goodbyes and to allow you to leave the hearts, even though we are over time, which is the first time it's scandalous in the history oh, wow. of my honest conversations. But thank you so much for joining us, for enduring my um, many questions from all over the place, but I just have so many questions that I couldn't I couldn't stick to one topic. And yes, I hope I hope we'll uh, get to meet somewhere, uh, maybe live, maybe have another conversation. It was a huge, huge pleasure. So thank you very much. I'd, I'd love that if that were possible. Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed it. Really great questions from you and, and from your from the audience. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone, and see you in a week. Bye bye.